So my name is Ben John Stonebray, and I'm an associate lecturer at the University of York, as well as a former student. And I'm currently the program lead for the postgraduate diploma in astronomy. So before we get on with the fun stuff, I do have a few technical notes to read out for you. So if you are watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. So this is available throughout the event. Questions can be asked at any time. Uh, if you have any technical issues, such as loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Uh, please do remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again later. If you'd like to turn on live captioning and uh, using a laptop or PC, uh, you'll see a button labeled CC Live Transcripts, usually at the bottom of your screen. And when you click on this, you'll be given an option to turn the captioning on. Uh, now, if you're using a mobile, you can turn captions on by minimizing the webinar using the ellipsis button, then tap the cog icon, scroll down to close captions and turn them on there. You can then restore the webinar and you'll still hear the webinar whilst doing this. So uh, tonight's very special guest speaker is David A. Weintraub. So David is an award-winning teacher and researcher at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, USA, where he's a professor of astronomy. And as well as Life on Mars, what to know before we go, he's also the author of Is Pluto a Planet? How Old is the Universe? And Religions and Extraterrestrial Life? How will we deal with it? So without any further ado, I'll hand over to David. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be with all of you today. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, maybe next time, but I think we have a, a lot to talk about this hour, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you, and we'll take a look at that to get started. I'm missing a button here, so hold on a minute. There we go. Now you should see my screen. So the book I want to talk about is called Life on Mars, What to Know Before You Go. I was fortunate to be able to update this in an edition that was published just a few months ago, which was just before three spacecraft got to Mars. For those of you who are paying attention, uh, both NASA in the United States and the European Space Agency and China all launched missions to Mars. And we they they all got to Mars in February of this year. So we have a lot of spacecraft on Mars. We're busy exploring Mars, and we've been doing this for several decades. The interesting question to me is, why are we doing this? Why are we so fascinated with Mars? There are several big questions I would like you to think about about Mars. The first one is, does or did life exist on Mars? This is truly the question that is driving most of the scientific exploration of Mars today. And the second question is, in some ways, a more existential question. Should we go to Mars? And I think the answer to the second question, from my perspective, is partly informed by what we learned in answering the first question. There is another question which all of you should be thinking about, and that is, can we go to Mars? And the answer is, not yet but soon. How soon? Very likely by the end of this decade, by 2030, we will have the ability as humans to go to Mars. But we can't come home. That's actually a very important piece of the puzzle that's missing in most people's thinking about this. We have SpaceX, Elon Musk's a, a space company that's trying to go to Mars. We have Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, his space company that's trying to go to Mars. We have NASA that's trying to go to Mars with humans, I mean. And most likely by the end of this decade, the rockets we have will be capable of taking humans to Mars and landing them safely on the surface. But if you want to come home, we can't do that. This is a one-way ticket to Mars for anybody who goes. And I think that's an important issue to be considering, but the bottom line is for the first time ever, by the end of this decade, humans will be able to go to another planet in the solar system. That's a big deal. And most of us will get to live through that experience, assuming we actually do this. These are side-by-side -side pictures of the Earth and Mars. I want you to have these in mind as you think about these two worlds. 
Mars is only about half the size and diameter of the Earth. It's about 10% the mass of the Earth. So it's a smaller planet, but it's pretty close in size and in every other way to the Earth. When you look at this picture of Mars, you see in the middle of Mars, let me turn on my laser pointer for you. You see in the middle of Mars, these white patches, those are clouds, water ice clouds. At the top of Mars, you see a polar ice cap. You can see through the clouds, through the atmosphere to the surface. Mars is a very Earth-like planet. In fact, one of the first things we learned about Mars was exactly that. This is a better picture of a full Mars. And again, you can see up at the top, you see the northern polar cap. You see down here at about nine o'clock in the picture, some giant volcanoes. You see this crack across Mars, it's called Valles Marineris. All the features we see on Mars, volcanoes, giant cracks, water, polar caps are very similar to Mars, to Earth, excuse me. One of the very first things we learned about Mars was that Mars is Earth-like. Christian Huygens, the Dutch astronomer, pointed his little telescope at Mars in 1659, and he saw this dark patch. This is the sketch he made of Mars. And he watched that patch, and he discovered that Mars spins, just like the Earth. To us today, that might not be surprising, but nobody knew these things 300 years ago. And not only did Mars spin, Mars spins in 24 hours. Mars has a day just like the Earth. Now, the Martian day turns out to be not exactly 24 hours. It's a little bit longer. But by 1800, astronomers knew that the day on Mars was very close to the same as a day on Earth. Mars orbits the sun in about 687 Earth days, which means the Martian year, the time it takes to orbit the sun, is pretty similar to the Earth year that Mars has polar caps, just like the Earth, that Mars has seasons, just like the Earth, that Mars has a thin atmosphere and clouds and a solid surface. And so by the early 19th century, astronomers were convinced that Mars was another Earth, just like Earth. And in the 19th century, astronomers did a tremendous amount of bad astronomy in studying Mars because they saw what they wanted to see. They found on Mars oceans, rivers, lakes, continents, seas. They found canals on Mars. Some people even began to speculate that there were real Martians on Mars. And by the turn of the last century, by 1900, astronomers had convinced themselves that Mars truly was Earth-like. And not only was it inhabitable, it was perhaps already inhabited. Most of those ideas about Mars were completely wrong, and they were generated by astronomers seeing what they wanted to see. And in the early 20th century, most of those mistakes were corrected. But this idea that Mars is Earth-like and could have once had life and might still have life is still a very, very powerful idea in astronomy. The question now is, Are we seeing what Mars truly has to tell us, or are we again seeing what we want to see with regard to life on Mars? When we look at Mars, we know Mars once had water. This is an old outflow channel on Mars where water that was probably below the surface and frozen melted and catastrophically flowed on the surface of Mars. The amount of water that flowed on the surface to dig out this channel probably was as much water as is carried by the Amazon River. Mars once had lots of water, but this ancient river feature truly is ancient. It probably formed on Mars three and a half billion years ago. The water is not flowing on Mars today. Today, When we look at the polar caps, and this is a map of the radar map of the depth of the water ice at the polar caps, we see lots of water. Mars has lots of water today. The polar caps are several kilometers thick. Lots of water. Much of what astronomers have been doing for the last 30 years is chasing the water, trying to learn just how much water 
Mars does have today. And what we've learned is that Mars once had lots of water, but it's lost a lot of that water. This is what Mars might have looked like three and a half billion years ago, except this is the Earth today. This is a part of the Earth called Hamlin Pool. It's in Australia. And the big rock-like features you see here are not rocks. They're living things called stromatolites. Stromatolites are objects like coral reefs that grow in layers with a layer of blue-green algae that then creates almost a rock-like layer and go, grows upwards and upwards and upwards, creating these rock-like features. These are modern stromatolites. But the most ancient stromatolites on Earth are the most ancient fossils of life on Earth. The most ancient stromatolite fossils are three and a half billion years old. Life on Earth existed three and a half billion years ago. And three and a half billion years ago, Mars probably looked just like the Earth. The search for life on Mars, as a result, is motivated by the idea that Mars might once have had life and might still have life. If Mars and Earth were nearly identical objects three and a half billion years ago in terms of the amount of water they had, the oceans covering the surface, if Mars was warm and wet, it could have had life just like the Earth. Mars is not warm and wet today. Mars is very cold and dry. But there's water at the ice caps, there's water in the atmosphere, and there's water below the surface. Much of that water is lost, but not all the water is lost. So astronomers have been trying to figure out how we search for evidence of life on Mars. The rovers that are now on the surface of Mars are actually searching for fossil evidence. They're looking for clues in the rocks that might indicate that Mars once had life. But there are experiments now that are looking for evidence that Mars has life today, active life today. And the evidence for that would be in the amount of methane gas in the atmosphere of Mars. Beginning in the 1960s, when we first started sending rockets to Mars, astronomers started measuring the amount of methane in Mars's atmosphere. In a moment, we'll talk about why that's such a big deal. The first measurements of methane found a tremendous amount of methane, and all those measurements were wrong. Later measurements found less methane and then less methane, not because the methane is going away, but because most of the early measurements probably were just measuring noise. But it's possible that Mars has methane. And the Curiosity rover, in fact, found that the amount of methane it detects appears to rise and fall with the seasons, which might indicate that life has something to do with that. So the big question is, one, does methane actually exist on Mars? And two, if so, what is the cause? What is creating that methane? There are a lot of skeptics about whether the methane actually exists on Mars, and honestly, I'm one of them, because the detection of methane, if it's right, is such a big deal. We need to be absolutely certain about those measurements. This is a pie chart that tells you about where the methane comes from on the Earth. On the Earth, rice paddies produce about 10% of the methane. What's producing it in the, in the rice paddies? Bacteria, living things growing in the soil, in the mud of the rice paddies. Methanogenic bacteria produce the methane. Termites produce about 15% of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere. Again, it's methanogenic bacteria in the guts of the termites. Livestock like sheep and goats and cows produce about 20% of the methane. Landfills, wetlands, wastewater treatment facilities produce about 30% of the methane. And all of that is coming from the organic decay or the decay of organic materials in those regions. And the other 25% comes from the production and combustion and distribution of fuels, coal mining, oil, shale. All of these fuels come from ancient life. 
100% of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere has an origin that says life exists on the Earth. There are about 1,800 parts per billion methane in the Earth's atmosphere. And that means if I had 1 billion molecules of the atmosphere, 1,800 of them would be methane atoms, methane molecules. On the Earth, the lifetime of that methane is only about 12 years. The Earth is four and a half billion years, years old. If you could go back three billion years, if the Earth had any methane, that methane's gone. If you could go back 100,000 years, and if the Earth had methane, that methane's gone. If you could go back 1,000 years or even 100 years, any methane that the Earth once had is gone. The methane in Earth's atmosphere today is being produced by life on Earth that exists today or through fossil fuel consumption as the result of life on Earth that used to exist. If all of those processes ended today, in 50 years, there'd be no methane in the Earth's atmosphere. The methane in the Earth's atmosphere is a clear sign that says life exists on Earth which is why astronomers have been looking for signs of evidence of methane in Mars's atmosphere. Mars's atmosphere is a little bit different from Earth's. Mars is a little bit further from the sun. So the lifetime of methane in Mars's atmosphere is a little bit longer. It's about 300 years, but 300 years is a blink of an eye compared to the history of Mars. Again, if we could go back a thousand years, None of the methane that is in Mars's atmosphere today, if there is any, would have been there a thousand years ago. All of the methane in Mars's atmosphere, if there is any, is being produced actively today. This is a cartoon that shows you four different processes that might produce methane on Mars. The one on the top left that shows you how ultraviolet light from the sun could interact with dust that rains down from asteroids and comets and produce methane in the atmosphere. The one on the top right shows you how dust devils, wind in, the Earth, in Mars's atmosphere could interact with formaldehyde and other materials in Mars's atmosphere to produce methane. The one on the bottom right illustrates how water could interact with olivine rocks to produce methane below the surface that could then bubble out in the atmosphere. And on the bottom left, you have a cartoon showing how microbes, life under the surface of Mars could produce the methane. Four different processes that have been advanced to produce methane in Mars's atmosphere, but two of them don't work. Two of them have been definitively ruled out, which means if there's any methane in Mars's atmosphere, it either comes from this process on the bottom right, which is called serpentinization, or it comes from bacteria. We got a 50% chance it's life if there's methane. That's why we're looking so hard for life. I wanna take you somewhere else for a moment because I really want you to think hard about the whole search for methane and what it means. If methane truly exists in Mars's atmosphere, then Mars has life. What does it mean for Mars to be a living world? This moon, Enceladus, is a moon of Saturn. It's a moon that has water ice, water below the surface. It has this subsurface ocean below its crust. There's another moon in the solar system, Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, which has the same thing. It's got a rocky, surface, a rocky ice surface, and below that surface, it gets warm, and it has a global subsurface ocean. In these oceans where it's warm, where there's energy to keep it warm and wet, these oceans have carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, magnesium, manganese, all of the elements that are needed for life. Astronomers think that in these subsurface oceans of these moons of Jupiter and Saturn, life could exist. Now, we're not just guessing about these oceans. We know these oceans are there. This, again, is Enceladus. And what you're seeing are 
water ice geysers erupting off the surface of Enceladus up hundreds of kilometers above the surface. These moons have subsurface oceans. In these subsurface oceans, life could exist. NASA had a mission called the Galileo mission that orbited Jupiter and studied Jupiter from 1995 until 2003. It studied Jupiter, it studied the moons of Jupiter, and in 2003, it ran out of fuel. Planetary scientists knew it was gonna run out of fuel, and they had a very vigorous debate about whether we should just let it run out of fuel and keep orbiting Jupiter, or do something else. And the decision was to do something else. Why? Because the gravitational pull of Jupiter and the randomly occurring gravitational pulls of the four big moons of Jupiter might cause this spacecraft eventually, in 100 years, in 1,000 years, in 10 million years, it might crash into Europa, the moon of Jupiter that has a subsurface ocean and could have life. And this spacecraft could contaminate Europa. So the decision was made to use the last little bit of fuel on this spacecraft to steer it into the atmosphere of Jupiter and burn it up so it could never contaminate Europa. NASA also had a mission called the Cassini mission that orbited Saturn from 2004 to 2017. And when Cassini was running out of fuel, planetary scientists asked the same question. Can we risk letting this spacecraft orbit without any fuel, without anyone being able to control it, where it might someday crash into Enceladus and contaminate Enceladus where life might exist. And the decision was made, no, we can't do that. So the last little bit of fuel on Cassini was used to steer it into the atmosphere of Saturn and burn it up so it could never contaminate Enceladus. Below the surface of the Earth, we know life exists. There are microorganisms living several kilometers beneath the Earth. I'm not talking about in the ocean. I'm talking about in the rock below the surface of the Earth. This subterranean biosphere is independent of the sun. It gets its energy, its food source, its heat from inside the Earth. And it's a tremendously robust ecosystem. This is the type of ecosystem that could exist below the surface of Europa, below the surface of, of Enceladus, and below the surface of Mars. If Mars once had life, that life could have been on the surface three billion years ago, and as Mars got cold and as the water dried up on the surface, it could have found hiding places below the surface. We know this is possible. So what about Mars? Should we go to Mars? If we've decided we should not risk contaminating the moons of Jupiter and the moons of Saturn that might have life, what about Mars? Mars is the closest place in the entire universe that might have life. The scientific rationale for wanting to explore Mars, wanting to find out whether Mars has or once had life is incredibly compelling. But what if we actually were certain that Mars has methane gas in the atmosphere and that Mars has active life today? Should we go to Mars? Just because we can go to Mars, should we actually go there and risk contaminating Mars? It's a profound question, I think, but it's no longer just an existential question. It has a real impact our exploration of Mars could have an impact on Martian biology if Mars has biology. So those are some of the questions that I think we should be thinking about before we go to Mars. And with that, I'll stop talking and open things up for questions. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. Um, so, uh, yep, we've got about half an hour for some questions now.
Um, so I've, I've already got a few here ready to go, but if anyone else does have any questions, please do, uh, please do type them in the chat box now. Um, just before we get started, um, I should let everyone know that you can get a copy of David's book, uh, Life on Mars, What to Know Before We Go, uh, with signed book plates from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Uh, and so there is a link to that on the uh, web page for this event, and it's foxlanebooks.co.uk slash festival of ideas, and uh, very much worth getting, although well, I might have to get the updated version myself. Um, so, yeah, we'll get started with some questions, and uh, very cheekily, I'm, I'm going to ask one of mine first, just to get the ball rolling. And so, David, uh, uh, in your book, and today you've but particularly so in your book, you spent quite a lot of time discussing the historical background to humanity's um, uh, obsession, if you will, with Mars. So do you think in the context of modern astrobiology, there should still be such a strong focus on Mars as opposed to, for example, Europa or Enceladus that you mentioned? I think obsession is the right word, but I think we're obsessed for the right reasons. Yes, I think we should continue to be exploring Mars. I personally think we could do a tremendous amount of exploration for several more decades robotically to minimize the possibility of contaminating Mars. I personally don't think we should set foot on Mars until we're certain that Mars is actually sterile. I think if Mars has living things on it, even if they're bacteria, bacteria is important understanding that bacteria could be profoundly important. And again, Mars is the closest place in the universe where we can search for signs of life. And the idea that Mars could have life is real. It's, we're not making this up. I think what we made up is that we already found life on Mars. We haven't. But the idea that Mars could have life or once had life, that's real. And if we found life on Mars, and if that life were DNA-based, the chances that DNA-based life started on Earth and started on Mars independently is almost certainly zero, which means life moved from one planet to the other, an asteroid hit Mars and knocked something off of Mars and it landed on Earth, and that's how life moved from one planet to another. That would be a profound discovery. If, on the other hand, we discovered that life does exist on Mars, and it has nothing to do with the DNA-based kind of life we have on Earth, that would mean life arose independently on Mars, which means on two planets side by side orbiting a boring star called the Sun, we have two different events where life got started. That would tell us something, again, profound about the likelihood that life exists in other places beyond our solar system. So I think the search for life on Mars should go on. I just think we should be very careful not to contaminate Mars before we learn the answer. Thank you very much for, for such a detailed answer. Um, and yes, it was uh, very interesting reading about uh, just the, the certainty with which people spoke about life on Mars existing in, say, the 19th century, that they were convinced that there was definitely intelligent life there. Um, yeah, very very interesting stuff. Right, I'll stop hogging the time now and move on to some of our um, attendees' questions. So, uh, from Rosie, I have, do you think Archaea may be able to survive on Mars? I, I'm not convinced that if you took ancient bacteria from the Earth and moved it to Mars, that those bacteria would survive. But there's a good chance it could. And certainly if there's ancient bacteria, if, if life existed on Mars 3 billion years ago, it had lots of time to figure out how to survive on Mars as the climate on Mars slowly changed over billions of years so that it could have found hiding places in caves below the ice caps, a kilometer beneath the surface. So ancient life on Mars, if it existed, certainly could have survived until today. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question from Jordan here, quite an existential one, as, so I think very much, uh, yeah, very interesting one. Should humans be happy that we haven't found anything alive yet or disappointed? 
Uh, happy is a very interesting way to try to parse that question. As a scientist, I want to know whether life does or doesn't exist beyond the earth in the universe. Are we alone in the universe? I'd like to know the answer to that. And I think astronomers are learning a tremendous amount to try to answer that question from the study of Mars, from the study of planets around other stars. I think in this century, we're going to come very close to having an answer to that, whether that's yes or no, I don't know. But should we be happy that we haven't found any life? I'm not worried about you know, aliens coming to Earth and you know, hauling humans away to another planet and putting us in cages. I don't think that's likely to happen. I think the most likely life that we could found, find will be far less advanced than us, will be microscopic life. I think if macroscopic life exists out there, we likely would have found it already, found evidence for it already. But I'm just guessing. But I'm not worried about finding life in the sense of, would that scare me? I'm not worried about aliens. But I'm excited about the scientific discoveries we might make. Thank you very much. Uh, Sophia asks, why is it a one-way trip to Mars? Very good question. Why is it a one-way trip to Mars? In order to come back from Mars, you need a rocket that's just as big as the rocket that took you to Mars. And most of the viewers today have probably seen the sizes of rockets that we launched today just to get to Earth orbit. Many of you don't remember the giant Saturn V rocket that NASA used to get to the moon 50 years ago. These are giant rockets. And most of what's in that rocket, it's just fuel. You need a tremendous amount of fuel to get off the surface of the Earth, to drill a hole through the atmosphere, and to launch your way to deep space beyond the Earth, a big rocket. If you want to go to Mars and come back, you need just as big a rocket with just as much fuel, which either means you have to take a second rocket with you, which means you need an even bigger rocket to launch that rocket, or you need to make the fuel on Mars to bring home. We don't have a rocket that's big enough to launch a double rocket with all the fuel, and we don't have fuel tanks that can hold the fuel for the seven month voyage to Mars and while we're on Mars and still have any fuel left in them when we get, we're ready to use it, the fuel would leak out. So at the moment, Absent any major technological breakthroughs, we have to manufacture the fuel on Mars and also have the rocket on Mars in which to put the fuel. And we don't know how to do either one of those things. So we have the ability to get to Mars, but once you're on the surface of Mars, the gravity is pretty strong and there really is an atmosphere that you have to get through to get back out. We don't have the ability to do that. Now, I'd also say we don't know for sure that we have the ability to keep anybody alive on Mars, despite the, I think, the accuracy of some of the things in the Martian movie. Yeah, maybe we could grow a potato on Mars. But can we grow enough food to survive on Mars? Can we find the water we need to survive on Mars? Can we generate the fuel we need to power the systems we need just for our life support systems on Mars? Or are we gonna to have to keep launching payloads and drop payloads onto Mars with the food and energy supplies we need to keep a colony going? I think we probably will have to su supply them for a long time to come. Maybe we could supply them for long enough to develop the technology to bring them home. But anybody who goes to Mars this decade, it's a one-way ticket. Thank you very much. And uh, you sort of started answering the uh, the next question I was going to ask, which is, uh, but I'll, I'll uh, read it nonetheless, which is from Joe, which is, how much of the Martian film do you agree with? I think the Martian film was very, very scientifically and engineeringly, if that's a word, accurate. Hopefully everyone who's watching has seen it, so I don't spoil anything for people. There was one thing in The Martian that I thought was wrong, and it's what makes the whole movie work, unfortunately. And that is, in The Martian, you have that spacecraft, the rocket on Mars, and the windstorm starts blowing, and the, the rocket starts 
teetering over and they need to launch that rocket before the windstorm knocks it over completely. Yes, Mars has windstorms, dust storms, but the atmosphere of Mars is so thin that it's very unlikely that the momentum in that wind could push the rocket around. So I don't think that rocket could have been blown over. But without that happening, you don't have a movie. So we got to give the movie people, the story writers, something there. The only other thing that I would quarrel with in that movie is assuming all of that happens and assuming Matt Damon is down on the surface growing potatoes from waste. It took the mission control four months to maneuver an orbiting satellite around Mars into position to be able to look back down at where Matt Damon was and discover that he was still there. I think that by the time we put colonists on Mars, astronauts on Mars, we would have the equivalent of a geosynchronous satellite, a Martian synchronous satellite that's orbiting right above the spot on the surface where that colony is so that we can watch them every minute of every day. So we'd never lose sight of them. That added a little bit of excitement to the movie. You know, there's a four month gap where we don't know what's going on. Now that's not scientifically inaccurate. I just think it's unlikely that that's how we do things at the point at which we can put people on Mars. But except for that, I think the, the movie really is very, very accurate. I liked it. Well, thank you very much. I, uh... For, for that two thumbs up. I haven't actually seen the Martian, but uh, but now I don't need to. Um, so uh, I've got a couple of questions here, uh, one from an anonymous person, one from Sean, and they're, they're related, so I'm going to ask them both together. So uh, the first part is, what, would, what could be the consequences of humans contaminating Mars? And then the second one from Sean, what is the chance that we have already contaminated Mars? All right, so they are related. Try to take them one at a time. What would the consequences be of contaminating Mars? One consequence could be that we destroy Martian life. We have a well-established track record on our own planet of humans finding habitats where there didn't used to be humans. And we colonize that continent, that island, that place, and destroy a lot of the life that was native to that place. We're actually pretty good at that. So one possibility is that we contaminate Mars and terrestrial biology competes with Martian biology and wins. Terrestrial biology is much more robust, much more advanced than Martian biology. So we might take over Mars and wipe out whatever life pre-exists us on Mars. I think that would be morally and ethically terrible, but that's one possibility. Another possibility is that we could coexist with life on Mars, that the biology on Mars isn't DNA based. We can't interact with it at all. And so we each do our own thing and there's no problem. I think that's less likely, but I can't prove that. It's a possibility. The third possibility is the Martians don't like us and it becomes like to pull something pretty low, pretty modern and what we all understand. It could be like a COVID-19 type of interaction in which the Martian bacteria or Martian viruses or whatever that Martian stuff is attacks terrestrial biology and wins. We don't know that that's not possible. And a third or a fourth possibility related to that third one is what's referred to as back contamination. That if we're able to go back and forth to Mars, even if the humans can't, if we can send packages back and forth from Earth to Mars and the surface of Mars, we could bring Martian life back to Earth. And that back contamination, we can't predict how that would play out. That could be neutral for life on earth or it could be very bad for life on earth so those are the myriad possibilities that could play out and there's no way to predict which one would be the right one could we have already contaminated mars yes 
but probably not, at least not in a way that worries me. Yes, we've had landers on Mars. Yes, we've had rovers on the surface of Mars. So stuff from Earth has already landed on the surface of Mars, but it hasn't penetrated the surface. I think that's what we really worry about with the moons, Europa and Enceladus, that something moving at 30 kilometers per second smashes into the surface and it digs a big hole and it penetrates down to where the life is. On Mars, life can't exist on the surface right now. The ultraviolet light from the sun, the cosmic ray particles from outer space sterilize the surface of Mars. In fact, if we went to Mars, we could not live on the surface of Mars unless you took a lead hut with you. That's another problem for potential colonists. I think they need a cave to live in to get below the surface where they'd be protected. And we don't know where the caves are yet, but that's a different question. In terms of contaminating Mars, I think we would have to penetrate below the surface, perhaps below the ice caps in order to interact with the life that's there. If we gently land something on the surface, anything that is on the surface of the rover or on the surface of the lander has been exposed to ultraviolet light from the sun for the seven month journey to get to Mars. And it's continually exposed to the, that harmful radiation while it's on the surface. So if a bacteria from earth hitched a ride to Mars and got out, it would be destroyed once it got out. It would have to get out very quickly and dig a hole below the surface, and it doesn't know that it should do that. So almost certainly we haven't contaminated Mars. There are great attempts made to sterilize everything that goes to Mars, but we can't be certain that everything that's gone to Mars truly is sterile. But anything that's still inside the spacecraft is not actually contaminating Mars. And anything that gets out almost certainly can't do any damage to Mars because it would get killed pretty quickly. So I'm not worried about what we've already done. But once humans go to Mars and we start digging holes and we start dropping payloads and we start farming and we start distributing our waste on Mars and we dig wells to find the water, that's when we would truly start contaminating Mars. Thank you. And uh... Another question has been asked while you were talking that uh, is probably worth briefly covering as well, although it's not strictly related to Mars. Uh, and it says that, have we contaminated the moon, given that we've been to the moon's surface? I think the same rules apply. The moon has no atmosphere at all, no protection from ultraviolet light or X-rays from space, cosmic ray particles from space. So anything on the surface of moon, the moon is sterile. I don't think there's any way anything could survive on the surface of the moon. And we haven't dug any big holes. Now we have dropped things onto the surface of the moon, some intentionally to make holes, but none of those holes are very deep. And the moon appears to be dry or nearly dry. There's a little bit of evidence that there might be water at the south pole of the moon inside a crater where it's shielded from sunlight, so it's incredibly cold. I think the evidence for that is strong, but not definitive yet. But over most of the moon, it's dry, it's sterile. It doesn't have a global ocean on the surface or under the surface. The moon's just a rock. So I think the chances that the moon has life are pretty much zero. I don't think that's controversial. But that doesn't answer the question, could we have contaminated the moon? Yes, humans went to the moon. We could have contaminated the moon, but any contaminants we left would be sterilized pretty quickly. So I don't think the moon is contaminated. Now, certainly when we went to the moon 50 years ago and the astronauts came home, we did worry about back contamination. The astronauts were put in sterile facilities for a while until we felt it was safe for them to come out. And the rocks they brought back were treated very, very carefully to make sure we couldn't contaminate the earth with anything from the moon. But what we know about the moon is almost certainly there was no back contamination that was possible because the moon is sterile. Thank you very much. Uh, so from Caitlin, we have the question, if Mars was hit by an asteroid, would it affect us on Earth? 
Uh, it might produce a nice light show briefly as we watch that explosion, but no, an asteroid hitting Mars would have no impact on the Earth. It could impact, well, it certainly would impact Mars a little bit, and it depends on how big the asteroid is. Now, we should note that asteroids are hitting the Earth and Mars all the time. You see those craters in the pictures of the surface of Mars, of the surface of the Moon, of the surface of Europa and Enceladus, and every object in the solar system is constantly being hit by stuff. Most of that stuff is very tall, very, very small. When you see meteor showers shooting stars, that's tiny little grains of sand equivalent, asteroids, but they're really tiny, burning up, being torn apart in the Earth's atmosphere. Bigger things actually hit the Earth. Meteorites are tiny little asteroids that hit the surface of the Earth. There are craters on the Earth. Most of them are fairly small. We think a fairly big object, maybe something 10 kilometers across, hit the Earth about 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs, among other things. So if a big thing hits a planet, it can cause significant damage, especially if there's life. But the number of objects out there, asteroids, which are big compared to Earth and Mars is zero. So if something hits Mars, it's going to be really tiny compared to the size of Mars. So it's not going to knock Mars out of its orbit. It's not going to do much to Mars other than put a dent in Mars. And that certainly is going to have no impact on the Earth. Now, it could splatter, if it's a big enough impact, it could splatter a couple rocks off of Mars, and those rocks would go into orbit around the sun, and some of those rocks might eventually land on Earth as meteorites. And in fact, we have many dozens of meteorites in our meteorite collections that we know are from Mars. That's probably the, the only way that an asteroid impact on Mars could affect the Earth. And if, again, if the Earth had no life, and Mars did have life, and an asteroid was big, big enough to splatter rocks off of Mars could do so, that's how life could travel from one part of the solar system to another. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, so I have a question from Laura here, I think relating to two parts of what you've discussed thus far, so, which is, how were humans able to return from the moon, but not Mars? The moon is a much smaller object than Mars is. The gravitational pull of the moon is much, much weaker than the gravitational pull of Mars. So it's easier to get off the moon than it is to get off of Mars. In addition, Mars has an atmosphere and the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. Much of the energy that's used on that rocket that we launched from the Earth is actually to push the atmosphere out of the way, to drill a hole through the atmosphere because there's so much friction with the atmosphere. The moon has no atmosphere, so you don't have to worry about that, but Mars does have an atmosphere. And even though it's a thin atmosphere, it's still an atmosphere that you've got to drill a hole through, so you need energy for that. Uh, those are the main differences. The, the gravitational pull of the moon is so much weaker, and the moon has no atmosphere. Thank you very much. Uh, so we've got a question from Imogen here, which is, why did Mars go from being wet to being dry? I wish we knew the answer to that question. We, ha we can speculate, and we can speculate in reasonable ways, but we truly don't know the answer. We know Mars has lost about 85% of the water that it was born with. So Mars once had oceans like the one in the picture behind me, covering much of the planet. Mars doesn't have enough water to do that anymore since so much of the water was lost. But why did it actually lose the water? Mars's gravity is a little bit weaker than the Earth's gravity. That probably has something to do with it. So it's easier for something to escape from Mars than from the Earth. Mars does not have a magnetic field. The magnetic field of the Earth protects the Earth from what's called the solar wind. You can think of the solar wind as particles that come out from the sun at speeds of hundreds of kilometers per second and effectively sandblast the top of the Earth's atmosphere, except they can't get to the Earth's atmosphere because the magnetic field stops the solar wind. Mars has no magnetic field, so it can't stop the solar wind. So Mars's atmosphere has been sandblasted, if you will, by the solar wind for 4 billion years, which means particles that get to the top of Mars's atmosphere can get stripped off by this wind from the sun. And the third reason could have to do with life. 
life on the earth has produced oxygen. The oxygen produces the ozone layer. The ozone layer stops ultraviolet light from penetrating deep into the atmosphere. If you put a water molecule on the surface of Mars, ultraviolet light can penetrate all the way to the surface and rip the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And the oxygen atom can rust a rock, which is why the rocks on Mars are so red. And the hydrogen atom is so light, it can bubble up to the top of the atmosphere and get stripped off by the solar wind. So the combination of Mars never developing life and never having any protection from ultraviolet light, combined with the solar wind being able to penetrate and strip things off because there's no magnetic field, and Mars's gravity being weaker, those three things together probably are the main causes of Mars slowly but surely losing one water molecule at a time. And one water molecule at a time after three and a half billion years adds up to a whole lot of water. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we've got time for a few more. Uh, so Chris has uh, mentioned the things you, you often hear about, volunteer programs for, for going to Mars where you know, people can answer the call and, and become a citizen astronaut. Um, what what do you think about such such programs and how likely they are? I think it, for the immediate future, let's say the next few decades, the number of people who can possibly go to Mars will be very small. And most of those people who might go to Mars will be very highly trained in something. You need doctors and engineers and computer scientists and whatnot in order for the group of people who go to Mars to have a chance of surviving. So just going to Mars as a tourist, I think, is not in the immediate future. But if you've got a few hundred million dollars, you can probably buy your way onto one of those rockets. Now, I don't have that. So, so I think citizen astronauts is a thing of the near future for going into Earth orbit but probably not for going to Mars. That being said, if you want to volunteer to go to Mars, you know, let Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and whoever else know you want to go. Just make sure you're fully informed about the possible outcomes of your trip. You have a seven-month trip in a rocket that may or may not be able to protect you from all that ultraviolet light and cosmic ray particles, so you may not survive the trip. If you do survive the trip, you're still exposed to all of that. So how are they going to protect you once you get there? But if you want to go, go for it. And there are a number of people I'd be happy to send. I'll volunteer them. That's, that's very generous of you. Um, uh, Arthur asks a somewhat related question. How long until we can build cities on Mars? Well, the United Arab Emirates has already developed plans to build a city on Mars, and their plan is to have a city on Mars built within 100 years. I think that's, I'll say it's not unrealistic. I don't know if it's realistic, but it's not completely ridiculous that if we have the money to spend to do it, we have the we will have the ability in this century to launch rocket after rocket after rocket to Mars and drop prefab structures onto the surface of Mars, or maybe we can drop you know, very advanced 3D printers onto Mars that can you know, rove around and scoop up the materials it needs, and the 3D printers can print habitats on Mars. It sounds like science fiction, and at the moment, it is science fiction. But people are really working on these problems to try to do exactly these things. So I think it's plausible, not in my lifetime, but if there are any single digit aged people watching tonight, you know, if you're eight years old, maybe in your lifetime, you'll see a small city on Mars. I don't think that's a ridiculous thing. Thank you. And I think this is probably the, the last question we've got time for, but it does follow on nicely from, from that one. Could we send technology to thicken the Martian atmosphere in advance of a human visit? There have been proposals, some of them uh, not good ones, to do what's called terraforming. Terraforming is the idea that comes from science fiction in which we would change Mars's atmosphere to be Earth-like. And there have been novels written in which 
the novelists explain how this might happen? The answer is yes. Mars has a very carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. The carbon dioxide is what produces the greenhouse effect on the earth. The greenhouse effect on Mars is not very effective. But if you could thicken Mars's atmosphere a little bit, you could make the CO2 more greenhouse effective and start warming up Mars. And if you did that, you might start melting the polar caps and you, you conceivably could make Mars Earth-like if you wanted to do that. I don't think that's something that could happen in 10 years. I don't think dropping a nuclear warhead on the polar caps, as Elon Musk suggested, is a very good idea. That has other consequences that might not be so good. But the basic idea that you could change Mars's atmosphere into being more Earth-like, warmer and wetter is a viable one. But I think it might take thousands of years rather than you know, a human lifetime. Thank you very much. And I wonder if you've perhaps just got time for one very quick fun one, which is if you were chosen to go to Mars and you decided that you were going to go, well, all questions, morality and ethics side, what five items would you take with you? What five items would I take with me? I never thought about that one. I've been asked if I'd go, and I think my answer would be no, because I value my children, my family, my relationships with friends, and I'm not ready to give all of that up. But if I could go, what would I take? I'd want to take a lot of chocolate with me. I know that. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that one. I think that's, <laughs> I, I'd take some pictures with me because if I don't know that I'm coming back, I'd want to have something tangible to hold on to that would remind me of home. And that's a really interesting question i don't have a good answer to that but i'll think about it. perhaps four four different bars of chocolate and a camera maybe that could be five there we go <laughs> all right well i think that's probably very much pushing it to the limit there so uh thank you very much david that was that was uh wonderful very informative very interesting thank you very much for your time today uh from myself and, and everyone at the university uh thank you very much everyone who came along um, I'll just remind you all again that, yes, you can purchase David's book through the link mentioned earlier and probably other uh, retailers as well. Um, the recording of this event will be available on the YouTube channel, uh, which you can access from the Watch Again section of the festival website uh, after the 20th of June, and you'll be let know by email when that's available to view. Um, and yes, and I think that's about it. So. Yeah, I'll just say thank you once again to David and thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Good night. Good night, David.